If you want to be forgotten by history, call yourself the Friendly Games. Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympics fans. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? In the continuing saga of which dwarf is Allison this week, <laughs> it would be sleepy. Aww. A little, little, little tired from staying up too late. So I'm going to I'm going to push through. Good. Gold good, medal. Good, 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 good. Yes. Go for the gold. We're going to jump right into our interview today because we've got a really great, fun, chat with uh, an author named Harry Blitzstein. Harry has worked as a freelance journalist since 1972, and his articles have appeared in many of Australia's top publications. He's also published several books, including 2017's Cold War Games, which is about Melbourne 1956 and the Cold War element to what was called the Friendly Games. Take a listen. Why did you decide to write about these Olympics from the Cold War angle? Okay, well, the Melbourne Games have been always called the Friendly Games. Each game sort of gets its own moniker. And they were called the Friendly Games. And I came upon an interview by the head of security. And he told these most incredible stories of spies in Melbourne, KGB, murders, kidnappings. Amazing stories. Unfortunately, by the time I'd got this tape, the gentleman was dead. So I couldn't really question him on it. So I went to uh, the equivalent of our CIA called ASIO and called in documents. And they just provided me hundreds and hundreds of pages of the most extraordinary stories of the Cold War. And, um, you know, as I read through this, I suddenly realised that Melbourne would, one, they weren't the friendly games. And secondly, there was just a fantastic story that needed to be told. And uh, it was, uh, I was pleased to have the opportunity to tell that story. So how did that moniker, the Friendly Games, really, a Friendly Olympics, really come about? Well, it was a straight PR idea by the government. Melbourne was nowhere on nowhere, no one's map. People would not know where Melbourne was, and we needed to somehow characterise the city to give it a, a welcoming feel. And so they were called the Friendly Games. And a lot of effort was put into making them the Friendly Games to the point that the CIA was actually banned from Melbourne. They were actually thrown out of Melbourne because they knew if the CIA was here, they would actually try and get communist athletes to defect. So they actually got thrown out. The Americans, being Americans, organised a private operation into Melbourne to get communists to defect and were quite successful, particularly with the Hungarians, because, of course, this was just a month after the Hungarian Revolution. So there were a lot of very unhappy Hungarians here who were quite happy to go to America uh, as defectors. This is kind of very early Cold War, but what was Australia's perspective on what was going on on the other side of the world? Well, we were obviously in the Western Bloc. We were very welcoming to Hungarian refugees. We supported the uh, invasion of Suez. So we were very very much in the Western camp. However, for the games, because we didn't want any problems, we wanted them to be the friendly games, we suppressed any form of dissent. So if Hungarians wanted to demonstrate, they were discouraged and uh, stopped. If the CIA were he wanted to get the fictions, they were thrown out of Melbourne. All of this was done to keep the reputation of the games pure and... Uh, uh, because this, you know, like a lot of Olympic Games, they're basically PR exercises for a city. A lot of money goes into it, and you don't want that money wasted through having either demonstrations or boycotts. And, of course, there were boycotts in Melbourne as well. So Australia is very much like the United States in that it's a country of immigrants. And 56, you're only 11 years out from World War II. And one of the things in your book that surprised me was... I guess I just never thought about it, how many communities in Australia there were that probably grew a great deal of World War II refugees. They were talking about Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Australians and the 
Polish Australians. Is that right, or was that much early, were they much older communities? No, no, no. Quite a few came out after the war. I mean, my own parents came from uh, Poland, and my mother came from Argentina. So we were very welcoming to uh, immigrants straight after the war. But in terms of a lot of the uh, immigrants from what became uh, Iron Curtain countries, a lot of them escaped straight after the war, seeing the communists coming in. And Australia was one of the places that uh, allowed them to, to come. So that's why we had so many Ukrainians, as you said, um, uh, East Germans, you know, quite a variety, uh, Russians. And, of course, they were very strongly anti-communist. And so they used to stand outside the Soviet ship, which had brought the athletes to Australia, trying to get contact with athletes and sailors and trying to say to them, stay in Australia. With the book, one of the things you did extensively was go back to the Helsinki Games to provide some context. So talk to us a little bit about why you chose to do that and what you learned that helped set the stage for Melbourne. Well, the Helsinki Games were the first where the Soviet Union actually competed. They were almost ready to go in '48, And uh, the then Minister for Sport, a guy called Nikolai Romanov, who's also a character in Melbourne, gets called in by Stalin. And Stalin sees this as an opportunity for propaganda. But it's only propaganda if the Soviets beat the Americans. And so he says to Romanov, sign this bit of paper saying that you'll beat the Americans. Romanov, knowing that Stalin wasn't someone who liked to be disappointed, uh, refused to sign the paper. <laughs> that's uh, an understatement, I... really. <laughs> <laughs> there, well, that's right. And in 52, Romanov thinks they've got a chance. So he does sign the paper and they go to uh, Helsinki. And Helsinki is very much a, a practice run, if you like. They're not quite sure what the Olympics are all about. They know they want to be part of it. There's not much espionage going on. Helsinki is right on the border with the Soviet Union, so they don't want any trouble either. And so the, the propaganda and uh, the sort of Cold War games are, are muted. Uh, they come out in full force by the time they get to Melbourne. Stalin is dead by that point, and you've got uh, Khrushchev, who's much more nuanced, and Romanov has got a, a freer hand in running the, the show. And he comes to Melbourne, and he's a, a big part of the story. Now, Nikolai Romanov has a very interesting name, and you didn't get into that at all in the book, but is there any connection in no. his family history? Okay, it was just coincidence. A very, very unfortunate name, because, of course, yes. Nikolai Romanov was the last czar. Yet he seemed to have quite friendly relationships with Stalin. Uh, Stalin wasn't into sport at all, but it, for him it was purely a political tool. And he seemed to respect what Romanov said, which, you know, you, don't, you sort of get this view of this angry, crazy, you know, dictator. Yet he was a, a quite a, 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 an astute politician when you actually read through some of the documents. So one of the things I love about the fact that that you went back to Helsinki is that we get two matches that we have both been dying to talk about for the price of one book. So Allison has been wanting to discuss the blood in the water game, which we'll get to, but I've also wanted to talk about the football match between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union from Helsinki for some time. So I was really excited to see that really explained well in this book. So talk to us a little bit about why that match was important. OK, well, you've got Stalin in the USSR, a man who didn't like to be crossed. And in Yugoslavia, you had Marshal Tito, who'd more or less declared independence from the Soviet Union. And the two guys hated one another to the point that they actually organised assassinations against one another. So Stalin's getting reports. I mean, this is how important the Olympic Games were. He's getting reports from Romanov of what's going on. And I, I know you want to talk about the Yugoslavian match. Do you want to do the Indonesian match first? Oh, yeah, that was fascinating. Because that was hilarious. <laughs> so the Russians come in as favourites. They're expected to just sweep through in the preliminary matches. And they come up against Indonesia, which is a nothing team, but happens to be coached by Yugoslavian, which is interesting. And... He's got these skinny kids who are just going to get absolutely pummeled by these big Russians. So he says, look, 
We're not going to win, but we're going to do something different. We're going to try a tactic where we won't lose. So he puts all 11 guys in the goal square and one guy in attack. And the Russians have never seen anything like it. I mean, no one's ever seen anything like it. And, of course, they can't score. They have about 54 shots on goal and cannot score. Uh, And this is humiliating, except that at one point, someone fires in a shot, it hits the crossbar, flies over the 11 or 10 Indonesian players, flies over the 10 Soviet players, lands in the middle of the field where the one Indonesian attacker is standing. The Russian goalie is actually in the centre of the ground because he is watching knowing that he, no one was going to bother him. And suddenly it's a race between the Indonesian attacker and the goalkeeper who's trying to get back into position. And he just barely makes it. And it's a draw, which is humiliating. Now, you know, the Soviets win the next game because they've worked things out. But that would have been terrible. But then they get in against the Yugoslavians. And they're being thrashed. Uh, in the first half, it's, I think, 4-1 from memory. And Bobov, who's their champion, is injured and is getting injections for uh, painkillers because he's barely on one leg. And they know that, as we mentioned before, Stalin was not someone who liked to be disappointed and particularly being beaten by Yugoslavia was just... They knew they'd be in trouble. And uh, they go into the second half. Yugoslavia, I think, scores another goal. So it's 5-1. And then Bobov scores about three goals and someone else scores another and it's a draw and they save the day and there's a rematch i think there's a rematch yes they lose the rematch which means that then they're going back to the soviet union and they don't know what's going to happen to them and the coach gets sacked and the players go back to their normal team and uh they're called the team of lieutenants each of the soviet football teams, this would be in the National League, is usually run by either the spy agency, by the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. So these were the Army team. And they go back and they're playing. And so one day after three matches, and they've won all three because they're a top team in the National League, uh, Romanov turns up. It's raining. uh, They're just about to hop on the bus. And he says, you're no longer a team. And all of a sudden, they just disappear. So can you imagine, like, a major team like the Yankees, all of a sudden playing one week and then the next week no one's talking about them and they just disappear off the face of the earth? And that was the equivalent of what had happened. And so that was the story of Helsinki. It was very interesting throughout the book. There was this constant fear among the Soviet athletes of, if I fail, what will happen to me or my family when I go back to the Soviet Union? And, you know, growing up in the 80s, that was sort of the joke about the Soviet Mm. Union. But it was really true that you might just disappear or your family may just disappear if you disappointed the leadership. It varied from one Iron Curtain country to another. Certainly in the Soviet Union under Stalin's time, that was the case. But you've also got to remember that these athletes were very famous within their own country and were much more popular than the politicians themselves. And you get places like in Hungary where, no, they wouldn't act. So even as we get into the story about the Hungarian uh, water polo team, the captain of the water polo team actually protests in Melbourne, carries the uh, independence flag and so on. Yet he goes back to Budapest and he's not punished or not punished badly because he is too important to punish. And so you get a much more nuanced view of what's happening in the Iron Curtain with sport. Certainly, it depended on the country. Countries like the Soviet Union were a lot tougher. Romania was particularly tough. But in Czechoslovakia and in uh, particularly Hungary, the athletes were more important. All right, let's get to the blood in the water game. What surprised me is that as I kept reading into it, it almost felt like it was sympathetic towards the Soviets. So how was that? You've got to remember the mood that the Hungarians came in. Their country has been invaded. They don't know whether their families are alive. 
I had one report of one of the athletes who they're madly trying to get news. All the phones have been cut off. Um, they can't get any reliable news out of Budapest. And, you know, they'd go to cinemas to try and see what was going on. And one was watching a, a, a newscast and this building is being uh, blown up by tanks. And he gets up in the middle of the cinema and screams, move the camera to the right, that's where my house is. So this was very, very personal. Um, they were and the enormous. timing was very close, right? So the, the, second, the second invasion was November 4th, and then the Olympics start at the end of November, and many of the athletes had already left That's to exactly get right. to Melbourne. So that yeah. this really was happening in real time. That's right. And so they were just very, very angry. And one of the incidents in the first half is where the, the captain of the Hungarian team, Jarmati, smacks the captain of the Russian team, Mishi is his nickname, I won't try and pronounce his second name, smacks him in the nose and breaks his nose. Mishi, who's a reasonably placid guy, is wiping the blood out of his nose, as one does, and Jarmati hits him in the nose again. Now, that is vicious. But putting it into context, when they used to play water polo, you know, before 56 and they'd be opposed to one another, when the Russians were playing in Budapest, Mishi would actually stay with Jarmati and his family and play with his daughter. So he's a family friend. That's how angry they were. But no, the Russians were getting belted, and Romanov is actually at the pool, screaming out, don't hit back, yet, yet, don't hit back. And they don't, and so they're literally punching bags for the first half. And then at the break, a KGB agent who is in the audience screams out, hit him. And then it really is, you know, blow for blow. And what happens is the, the man who's going to have blood on his face, the famous photo, is a guy called Zador. And he's a young buck. Uh, he's going to be a future champion. He's strong. I mean, water polo players are tough. But he's particularly strong. And one of the other players comes up to him and says, look, I'm on this guy called Propoff. He's belted me in the ear and I think he's burst my eardrum. Can you take him? And Zardos is not a problem. And so 90 seconds to go, these two guys are hitting one another and the whistle goes. And Zardor knows that the referee has been on their side all the time. Every time there's a fight, the free goes to the Hungarians, Swedish uh, referee. So he turns around expecting that he's been seen and he's going to get a free shot at goal. They're already for zip, so they've won the game, but they want to humiliate the, the Soviets. And as he turns around, Propov is actually, it's his turn to belt Zador, is rising out of the, the water and getting to an elbow to the face. But because Zador's turning around, he the only accident was that he hit him in the forehead rather than in the face, and that's where it bleeds a lot. And this is where it gets interesting. So all of this is just part of the fight. Now, Zardor is, they're 15 metres or more away from all the action. He's ready to climb out of the pool. His eyes swelling. He can't play anymore. It's 90 seconds to go. They've won the game. He's ready to go downstairs, get a bit of plaster on his eye and uh, celebrate. Jarmody swims over to him, looks at him, sees the blood, and he thinks, gee... This represents everything the Russians have done to us in uh, Hungary. And he says, don't get out of the pool. Swim across the pool. I want to see blood in the pool. And when you get out, I want to make sure that your face is always towards the cameras. And that's exactly what happens. And I've looked at a lot of film. And at no point does Zadur do what you would naturally do, wipe the blood out of your face. He wants those cameras to see it. So whereas it wasn't a setup, the fights were all genuine, the actual photograph was choreographed. And it's become one of the most famous photographs in Olympic history. Exactly right. Exactly right. And then the poor old Russians have been belted, go downstairs, and they're actually in the same room, the changing room, with the Russians at one end and the Hungarians at the other. And after the, the match, the Australian captain, Ray Smee, who's watched the match, 
is absolutely outraged. This is going to ruin the reputation of the Olympics as the friendly games. And he storms downstairs to talk to both the Russian and the Hungarian athletes. Uh, they're both in the same dressing room, Russians at one end, Hungarians at the other. Ray Smee storms down and he's ready to start yelling at them until he suddenly realises the Russians don't speak English, the Hungarians don't speak English, he doesn't speak Hungarian or Russian. And so that's all a bit of a fiasco. Uh, the poor old Russians then leave by bus. They actually have to lie on the floor of the bus because there's Hungarians out there for their blood, the spectators. And they get back to the Olympic Village. At this point, Romanov rings up Moscow to tell them what's happened. And this takes a bit of time to get through. And at two o'clock in the morning, he wakes up his players. They're going to be playing for the bronze the next day. But he wakes the players up at two o'clock in the morning to tell them off because that's, he knows that they're going to look bad in the press because it's a bleeding Hungarian, not a bleeding Russian that's going to be on the front pages of the newspapers. And so Stalin's told him, you know, we've got to take a hit for this. And so he tells them off. But that same KGB agent is at the same meeting and he's saying, no, you should have hit them harder. So there's actually a row between the KGB guy and uh, the Minister for Sport. And there's a, a, a little after story about that. The particular KGB agent was called Mitrikin, Vasily Mitrikin. He goes back to Moscow and he's benched. He's not allowed to go on another overseas operation again, ever. And they put him in the archives, which is sort of the, the Siberia for the KGB without actually going to Siberia. And uh, he spends 20 years there. And then at about 1986, he packs up the archives and defects. And our greatest knowledge of the KGB comes from the Mitrican files. And we wouldn't have got the Mitrican files had it not been for the blood in the water match. Wow. So they actually have implications that go way beyond what you'd actually think. So these are the sorts of stories that I uncovered. Well, so many of the stories that are in the book, it's this constant tension between the politics invading the sport and sport invading politics and the implications mm. back and forth between the two. That's and right. And that, you know, we talked about it when we talked about 1980 or, or some of the things that happened in 76, you know, how much politics is allowed to encroach on sport and vice mm. versa. And very much 56 is about that tension between the two sides. That's right. And it's enhanced because, of course, the Hungarian Revolution a month before and the invasion of Suez. So, you know, it was a very, very political games. But in a way, if you want to be forgotten by history, call yourself the friendly games. And that's what's happened to the Melbourne Games. People have not sort of gone back and seen what really went on. One of the other stories is the love story between the Czech gymnast Olga Fikatova and Hal Connolly, a uh, disc, uh, hammer thrower. And that's a lovely story of crossing the Iron Curtain, if you like, where they two get together, they fall in love in Melbourne, he proposes, but then the Cold War intrudes and they're worried that she's going to defect, that she might take other Czech athletes with her. And so the whole Czech team gets kidnapped and they're forced to board the Russian ship, the Gruzia, and they travel home in that way. And it's the most horrendous trip back because the Soviets had never expected to take on all these extra passengers. So they've got all these extra passengers. They're struggling to provide food. Uh, they run short of fresh water. But even worse, they run short of toilet paper. And this is a real crisis. And so the Czechs have a, a meeting uh, about finding substitutes and Olga has to make a very strong case that they don't use the love letters from hell to her in that for that purpose shall we say but eventually the uh, the Czechs discover a sudden interest in the ship library and start borrowing copies of Marx and Lenin and Stalin they never get returned those books but they're put to good use and there's a bit of a political statement there as well yeah, there was a there's a whole Romeo and Juliet story of Melvern with these two athletes, right. which is wonderful. Yes, yes. And, and has uh, a little bit of a happier ending. 
than Romeo. We'll, we'll give that spoiler away. At least. Yes. It does. It does. And Olga's still alive and living in California. Hell died quite a few years ago. But it's really interesting when you're trying to get hold of these athletes. And I have trouble. Now, this woman is well into her 80s. And trying to schedule a meeting, uh, an interview with her, was difficult because she was out as a personal trainer at 80, 85. Oh, um, my goodness. Wow. Another woman I spoke to who was a kayaker used to do the Murray Marathon, uh, which is about 500 kilometres of kayaking, but had to stop when she was about 82 because she had a hip replaced and couldn't get in and out of the kayak. I mean, a lot of these people are still with us, are incredibly fit and are wonderful to talk to. And that was one of the joys of researching the book. Was actually did you, find, to the did you find people receptive? In, yes, in wanting I did to talk, happy to, to talk. And one of the nicest things is I got hold of one of the uh, water popper players, uh, Nick Martin. Miklosh Martin, but he calls himself Nick. He lives in California as well. And I sent him that chapter and he said, you know, he was able to say, look, you know, you captured it. You've got what happened. You, you've got it right. And so when you said before, I gave a little bit more sympathy towards the Russians, he read that and he said, yeah, well, that's what happened. But we ended up looking good because we were the martyrs. How did the Olympics play in Melbourne itself at the time, was there any awareness of kind of the bigger issues? We read in the newspapers a little bit. So obviously the, the, the blood and the water, the photo, we saw that. The boycotts were covered a little bit before, but very, very uh, cursory. We didn't want to see these things. We weren't interested. The editorials, if anything, were hostile towards the Hungarians protesting. So at the same time as we were welcoming Hungarians who were being, fleeing their country because of the persecution and the invasion, we were criticising those same Hungarians who were protesting against that in Melbourne at the time of the Olympics. So that was sort of the dichotomy, if you like. I mean, Melbourne was an incredibly provincial place in 1956. In the suburbs, very traditional families, and women would tidy up the house in case on the off chance one of the foreign visitors would happen to drop by for a cup of tea. I mean, that's how it worked. I spoke to one young kid who uh, would stand outside the Olympic Village inviting athletes home. And some of them would actually come home and have a Sunday meal. And we were a very insular place. Most Australians had never met migrants face to face, even though we had, you know, they were in their little ghettos, if you like, but they didn't know what they were like. They didn't know their habits. We were fascinated by them. And so they would invite them home. So it was a, a very, very interesting time. I mean, TV had only just come in 1956 in time for the Olympic Games. And we were very self-conscious. It was the first time that the world was looking at us. And so we started to think, what is the world seeing? You know, this very quaint, antiquated place, you know? So it might've been the fifties, but it would have been like, you know, the 1920s in America, you know, small town. And the athletes were there for longer because of the distance. It seemed like there, many of them came two and three and, you know, weeks ahead of time, sometimes a month, and then also stayed. That's right. Because the transportation to and from was difficult. Well, that's right. Well, when the Hungarians came, it took them over five or six days because they were on charter flights and there were no replacement pilots. And this would have been the case with a lot of the athletes. Uh, the Russians were in a ship and that would have taken over three weeks. So, yes, it was a, a long trip here. I mean, it was amazing that we even got the Olympic Games. And I think we beat Argentina by a vote. And if you want a little bit of early skullduggery, this was where the first bribes happened at Olympic bids. The bidding was in London in 1948, during the 48 Olympics, which were called the austere Olympics because it was still rationing and so on. So the Australian uh, bid committee, the Olympic organising committee, bought food 
lots of food and had banquets and they won by one vote. Wow. People can bribe me with food. There you go. <laughs> Unfortunately, you don't vote at uh, the IOC. But that's what happened. in, uh, And that most probably swung it. Okay, wow. so speaking of the IOC, let's talk about Avery Brundage. Yes, I know a lot about yeah. Avery. Brundage. He is yeah. an interesting man. Okay, you're being kind. I would call him <laughs> something else. But one of the things that you talked a lot about is he turned a blind eye to what a lot, especially in, in this case with the USSR and, and a lot of the countries were doing with making the athletes members of the army or members of the police and paying them to be athletes. That's right, the so-called sham amateurs. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet, if there was an individual athlete who got any money for anything, he came down on them like a ton of bricks. So did you find anything that reconciled that yes. issue? I won't say I've become sympathetic towards him, but I understand him better. For him, there were several things that were really important. The games had to be universal, and they had to go on. The games must go on regardless, because anything that would stop the games could end the movement. And he believed in the movement with a religious fanaticism, if you like. And he was actually quite idealistic in that. But there was a series of priorities. So, yes, amateur was very important when he could enforce it. But if enforcing it, the Olympic Games weren't universal because the Soviet Union would just step outside the movement. And this was his big worry. And I actually uncovered documents when the uh, Soviets were applying in 52 where people within the IOC were really worried, saying, if we don't let them in, they might set up an alternative Olympic Games. And in fact, there were things called the Spartacats, which were alternative Olympic Games. And all the Eastern European countries and so on would participate. And so that was the big worry. So it was the looking at two evils, this was the lesser, was to allow them in, turn a blind eye and so on. The other thing is that he worshipped sport per se, and he saw that the Soviets did as well. He actually went to one of these Spartacates, and he just saw that it was their whole lives. And he thought, this is what it should be. And he believed that through sport, you would actually create a superior human being. And that superior human being would transcend politics and would actually overthrow bad regimes. So he had quite a, a complex philosophy behind it. But ultimately, it was better to have the Soviets in the movement than outside the movement. But in terms of amateur, yes, he was tough on individuals and he did some absolutely dreadful things, particularly to American athletes. Jesse Owens is, you know, what he did to Jesse Owens was absolutely disgraceful. And, you know, eventually, uh, you know, he, he slowly lost traction on that whole area of amateur sport. The other story uh, with Avery Brundage and 56 are the two Germanies. Yes. Who, this is like the worst arranged marriage ever. They did not want to be a combined, neither Germany wanted to be with the other. And yet yes. Brundage really insisted upon it. Yeah, and this is part of his idealism, that the Olympic Games is not a sporting event. It was set up originally very much as an idealistic thing of creating a more peaceful world through fair play and sportsmanship, as setting an example. And Brundage believed this down to his bootstraps. And he saw the opportunity with the two Germanies of being able to prove how the Olympic Games could actually create peace. And he, he used to, he forced both East and West Germany, as, as you said, who hated one another, to combine under one team, one flag, they had the, the German tricolour with the Olympic uh, rings in white over the top, and uh, they weren't allowed to play the national anthem, but had to play Beethoven's Ode to Joy. And so he was able to say, we have done something that politicians have not been able to do. And that's a, you know, regardless of what you think, and it might have been horrible for the two Germanys, Symbolically, that was really, really important. It was, you know, hoisting the, the, the flag up the flagpole that the Olympic Games is a, a movement for 
good, not just a sporting event. And so symbolically, yes, it was very important. Um, it doesn't last much longer, and eventually it falls apart in 68, and that's the last games where they compete under the one flag. But it did continue for a little while. There's another story that I'm actually researching at the moment that may be something you could look at at a, another podcast, that in 68, there were four cities that bid for the Olympic Games, uh, Mexico City, Detroit, Buenos Aires and Lyon. But there was a fifth city that most people don't know about, and it was Berlin. And Brundage supported a bid from Berlin, which would actually be East and West Berlin together organising the Olympic Games. In 68? In 68. And I actually have cartoons from Germany of a pole vaulter pole vaulting over the wall, <laughs> say, so, which is saying sport can actually transcend Cold War wow. politics. Now, there is a story. So wow. keep that one in mind. Well, that That's feeds into, book. yeah, that feeds into how Korea is talking about doing a North and South, doing a joint bid yes. for, for 32, I think. Are they? Yeah. yeah, there's that discussion going on. That's right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Brundage forced the two Germanys together, but not the two Chinas. Yeah, that was also interesting to see. You want the two China story? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> The communists have come in in 49. They control mainland China. The uh, nationalists have fled to Formosa or Taiwan. Uh, they obviously hate one another. But the Olympic movement allows them both to compete. And they both intend to compete in Melbourne. The problem is, for both of them, is whoever gets here first and hauls up their flag, the other one will boycott because there can only be one China, and both of them say, we are the one real China, so there can only be our flag. And so there's a competition between both of them to get to Melbourne first. There is a secret deal with the Australian organiser, who is anti-communist, to make sure the Taiwanese get here first. And so they do arrive first. They arrive on the day of the flag raising. They get to the airport, they immediately hop into a taxi, fly out to the Olympic Village where the flag will be raised. The Chinese are actually in a ship ready to come to Melbourne with about 70 athletes. So they had every intention of competing, but they needed to get their flag up first and it didn't look like they were going to. The Taiwanese arrive at the Olympic Village and they say, quickly, raise our flag. And the Australian organisers say, well, look, we will, but one... It's scheduled for 15 minutes time. Two, we will actually raise the Olympic flag first, the Australian flag second, and we'll get around to the Taiwanese flag then. So just hold your horses. I can't see any communists around here. So you're going to get in before them. Don't worry. And so they wait the 15 minutes. And, of course, their arrival is unexpected. So they tell one of the uh, young army people who's there to go and get the Taiwanese flag. And... Off he goes, and he goes to the flag locker. Now, the problem with the two Chinas is they had different names. There was Red China, Communist China, People's Republic of China. The other side was Nationalist China, uh, the Republic of China, Formosa. Which one was it? And, of course, what he'd been told, the name he'd been given, was not against the flags that were there. So he, he sees one that says China, he pulls it out, and he's about to leave, and outside are some, is a Chinese gentleman, a very helpful Chinese gentleman, who says, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm just getting the flag for the nationalist Chinese. And he says, well, have you got the right flag? And the guy says, I don't know. And he says, well, look, let me just have a look. And the helpful Chinese gentleman says, no, no, you've got the wrong flag. Goes in, grabs the other flag, gives it to the corporal, who then goes, and that's what's hoisted. And, of course, it's the communist flag. And he's just met a... Chinese communist agent. <laughs> and of course, immediately, the Taiwanese are ready to march out. The communists are ready to sail uh, into Melbourne. And um, in the end, it was abject apologies by the Australians that let the Taiwanese stay and the Chinese, ne uh, the communists never got to compete, which would have been their first Olympic Games. And this is still an issue today because Taiwan 
still yes. does not compete under its own flag. It competes under a neutral flag. Exactly. China right. competes under its flag, but we still have the two China issue all these years later. It's well, not actually, been resolved. That's right. So, I mean, this was a problem through the Cold War. The IOC deal, dealt with each of these issues in different ways. I mean, the problem was that they were trying to play big, you know, they were trying to be a UN without necessarily understanding the nuances that went on with the politics. How difficult was it to understand what was the truth? Because you're dealing with Australian newspapers that are telling one angle, you have propaganda, you have people that have differing opinions. Where did you Memory. find your middle ground? Yeah, generally I preferred accounts that were written at the time. So, for example, I interviewed the corporal, uh, Brian Agnew, who got the wrong flag, and spoke to him. And I said, you know, tell me what it was like. And he says, oh, no, I didn't do anything. I just stood under the flagpole the whole time. And I said, no, you didn't. You went and got the flag. You got it mixed up and so on. He says, no, I didn't. And so he had totally forgotten. And I had a report from his commanding officer written that afternoon. And I read it to him. And he said, did I do that? So you've got the problem of memory, mm -hmm. which is a real problem. So I try and get documents that are as close to the time as possible. And then you try and look at verification of what's going on, whether it makes sense. So, for example, the story of uh, Romanov screaming out nyet nyet at the water polo was seen by Ray Smee. He didn't know what else he was saying, but he assumed that that was going on. But then I got a Russian account about the second meeting at night where Romanov and the KGB agent are having a fight. Now, that's exactly the same story as what happened during the game. So I know that it's true that there was this conflict between those two people about fighting back. So it's one of those things that you do as a historian that you, you've you got to look at your various sources and, and make a judgment. But, you know, the general rule of thumb is try and get as original documents as you can, be sceptical in what you've got. And, yeah, that's really the, the sort of of things that you you can only do but generally people forget they reinvent situations um, they become heroes of their own story all of those sorts of things that you've got to guard against so often when I go into an interview I've read as much as I can I've got all the stats in front of me and if I get something that doesn't ring true I actually will challenge who I'm interviewing I mean I spoke to a, a football player who told me he was captain of his team and I actually had the stats in front of me. And I said, you only play 50% of the matches. You can't have been captain. You would have played it all. And he'd just forgotten. You know, he'd been captain at the Asia Games, but not at the Olympic Games. So these are the sorts of tasks that you have as a historian. What do you think the legacy of 56 is, was, the effect it had on the games that followed? I think because the politics was so open, it sort of granted permission. Up till then, there was a certain aura around the Olympic Games that they were apolitical. I mean, there were some games played at Helsinki, but they were very, very subtle, very, very subtle and not overt. But in Melbourne, we had supposedly six boycotts, some real, some weren't so real. But that was what the paper said. There were six countries boycotting for political reasons. So that made it very political. The blood in the water was a very political statement. Even the love affair between Olga and Hal was, again, very political, very, you know, it was something that was very obvious to people. So I think it set it up that it was a fair battleground, particularly with the Cold War, for countries to be fighting one another. It was also significant because the Soviets beat the US in the medal count. And that was humiliating for the Americans, absolutely humiliating. And so that sort of set a pattern for the future games. And really, 60, 64, that continued not at the same intensity as Melbourne. And then in 68, it was overtaken by the Black Power salute, which is what we remember, which is, again, another stage. For the first time, we've now got athletes protesting overtly. But there was also a lot of politics going 
on with having both Rhodesia and South Africa thrown out of the Olympic Games. There was also the invasion of Czechoslovakia, and a lot of people don't know that there was also a Czech gymnast who protested because that didn't get into the newspapers. Uh, and that story is, again, should be told because it's a, an amazing story. So uh, politics runs through a lot of Olympic Games. Up to 56, it was more subtle. But after 56, people saw it for what it was. Politicians, activists went in unashamedly, if you like. They no longer worried that they were creating a precedent. It had been set in Melbourne. Excellent. Harry, thank you so much. Where can we find your book? Okay. Well, at the moment, it's only been published in Australia. Still looking for an American publisher. So uh, hopefully, perhaps someone's listening to your broadcast might uh, pick that up. But it hasn't been published there. And unfortunately, you can't even, I don't think, get it on Amazon. Oh, really? Um, it's not, not no e-edition? That's right. They, it's, it's only been published in Australia and New Zealand Territory and they tend to block its sale elsewhere, which is really unfortunate. So uh, I'm hoping in the next perhaps 12 months the book will be available. I'm currently working a book on a 68 Olympics and uh, I'm hoping someone will pick up both books as a couplet on the Olympic Games. So uh, a little bit of patience, but hopefully those stories are there. But some of those stories or uh, other stories that I couldn't get into the book are on my website, which is... Uh, harryblatstein.com so and if people look under that they'll see a little bit more definitely. we will, we will put will, a link yes we will link to Thank that you. in the show notes and if you happen to be traveling to Australia and New Zealand look for the book otherwise Please. <laughs> take it back as a souvenir <laughs> exactly <laughs> ship copies our way because it, it really is a great, a great read book. so thank yeah. you Thank so you. much Harry you can read more Olympic stories at harryblutstein.com. We'll have a link to that in our show notes. Our Australian and New Zealander listeners should be able to get a copy of the book fairly easily, and other listeners might be able to find it on Amazon or some other bookstores. It looks like there's some used copies on Amazon, and it, you might be able to get it on Kindle. If you decide to shop through Amazon, we'll have a link to the book on our website, and if you click through that to order, we'll get a commission, which helps support the show. Oh, Harry was so much fun. I got to talk about my blood in the water match. I know. And, that... and yeah, it was, it was so great to, to get that one talked about and look at that 1952 soccer game. I know. That was bucket list event, Olympic events for us that we got to cover. So that was really great. And he just knew so much about so much. I know. Oh. Which was great. Are we going to have more from Harry for our Patreon? We're going to have some more more clips from Harry for our Patreon listeners who donate at the $5 a month level and above. Harry is working on a book about 1968 Olympics, and oh, he's got some great stories from that. And there were some other stories from Melbourne, uh, 1956, that did not make the final edit. So be on the lookout for that, patrons. I think that's going to be one of this month's highlights, which will come out this week. If you are interested in joining our Patreon club, go to patreon.com slash olimfever. Our Patreon patrons also get advanced notice on some of the big doings that are going on with the podcast, including some information about the partnership we mentioned last week that we've got going on with pincollector.com. That's going to launch pretty soon, but our patrons know what is going on. So if you are interested, check out our Patreon site for more. We also do take one-time donations. Uh, you can find a link to PayPal on our support and sponsorship page on our website, olimfever.com. I think it's time for tofu. <laughs> We're moving on to our Team Olympic Fever segment. This is a segment where we update you on what's going on with our past guests who make up what we call Team Olympic Fever. The dulcet tones of Jason Bryant have landed in Tokyo to announce the wrestling test event for Tokyo 2020. He's been putting up some pictures in our Facebook group, which if you're not a member of that, you should join. It's Olympic Fever Podcast Group, and you can see what he is seeing in Tokyo. It's pretty cool. I want to hear, I want to hear about the venue. Oh, I want to hear about the venue, too. I want, like, full-on detailed report. So, so we'll, we'll check have in. To, you, yeah, we'll check in. When he gets back. Charlie White, our Team Olympic Fever ice dancer, and his partner Meryl Davis were on talks at Google for a discussion about their dedication and persistence to the sport, their journey to gold in Sochi, and how they've managed to stay humble all while being the best of the best. 
And we'll have a link to that in our show notes. That was really cool. They are, I mean, like, I would listen to Charlie White any day. He was great. Yeah. He, he was great in this, and he was just so much fun when, when, he, when we spoke to him. Mm-hmm. So when they talk, when athletes talk about, oh, I've stayed humble, he really has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, He's just a normal everyday guy, right? And when we met him, sort at the of the hundred days out from Pyeongchang, he was Chris from IT. <laughs> he had cut his hair and he was wearing his glasses and he had on a windbreaker. And I'm like, who is that? It's Chris from IT. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's Charlie White. <laughs> Wins a gold medal and fixes your computer. That's right. <laughs> and sometimes you on on certain days you wonder which is more valuable. <laughs> All right, moving on to some doping news. We probably should get a doping news sounder because we talk about doping enough on the show. Would it be like an a, a, a ambulance siren? I don't know, either that or like some dreary, dreadful tones. Because it's so depressing when we have to talk about this. I know. But... Like an iron door slamming. <laughs> so uh, T-Bock said that they are going to take a fresh look at what's going on with the Russian doping claims. So last week we talked about how WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, had said Rusada, the Russian anti-doping agency, may have uh, tampered with some of the samples that they handed over. So the IOCs, they, they've got an eye on it, and they're, they're just taking a look. So along with food safety, t is now going to be performing your analysis. <laughs> which I hope he won't do at the same time as the food safety <laughs> checks. This is just, if it wasn't so upsetting, it would just make me laugh. Oh, I, yeah, I know. I know. But now, now I have an image of T-Bock in his lab coat with the, and a hairnet. Well, doing food safety, then going to wash his hands and then looking in a microscope to, I see steroids. <laughs> I see foodborne illness. Here I see steroid. I don't know why I just made him sound <laughs> Russian. <laughs> I do not have a good T-Bock voice. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> All right, let's, let's just slide on over to Tokyo 2020 news. Thousands of tickets were bought with fake IDs for the Tokyo 2020 games. And this is the Japanese lottery that so many people subscribe to and so many people were disappointed. So organizers realized that 6,900 tickets were bought with fake IDs. So they decided to void the tickets out and they are going to reissue them. So those people who bought it with fake IDs, no refunds. Yeah, there you go. Which I love. Yes, right? Like... You go trying to use your fake ID like some 16-year-old trying to buy beer. Uh Uh-uh. You lose out. And that is from the Kyoto News reporting that. And new curb designs, which you wouldn't think would be that big of a deal. But because buses are going to be the major way that people are going to get around within Tokyo, they've come up with this new curb design so that the bus can get really, really close to the curb without damaging the tire. Yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, Matthew Smith from Inside the Games wrote about this. And they've worked with the, this is where your uh, your top sponsorship comes in because Bridgestone has redesigned tires that are a little narrower. They don't, they don't stick out as far. And then the curbs are more sloped. So people can more safely exit and not trip in the gap, which, which I have done. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great idea. It's going to be great for the Paralympics, but I think in terms of transporting a lot of people, I bet people will be able to board the buses faster because they don't have to look for that gap. And, and that weird step, because there's always that moment where you say, do I step down mm-hmm. into the gap to go back up, or is it close enough that I can make it? And if you don't have to make that split-second decision, all those split seconds will add up. And all of a sudden, you'll take like 10 minutes off the bus ride. Bravo. I'm excited about that. I think that's pretty cool. We've got some news from Pyeongchang. Inside the Games reported that legacy plans for three of the venues have finally been established a year and a half later. Okay. Post the Games. And this is for the Alpensia Sliding Center. 
the Gangneung Hockey Center and the Gangneung Oval, which hosted uh, speed skating. They're kind of a, the sliding center is going to be a sports experience. So my guess is it'll be like what we have at Lake Placid, where mm-hmm. you can ride a bobsled mm-hmm. and they do some other things up at the uh, the Lake Placid Sliding Center. But it was very loose. Plans. Right. Yeah, it was very weird how, oh, we had these plans, but they're, we've got plans. How hard is it to come up with a plan for a skating rink? I I know, I know. And we were talking about this before the show. Why weren't the international federations involved with, like, don't they have some kind of foundation arm or something where they say, we're donating a whole bunch of equipment to you so you can start a hockey program, a youth hockey program, or have rental skates for ice skating sessions? This is not that complicated. I don't understand. I mean, I can understand the sliding center to a certain extent. What do you do with a sliding center? You, it, it's got to be a sliding center. And even the oval. But a hockey rink? Why is this just not a public skating rink at the very least? Right. I don't get it. I mean, and it just I wonder if this all still stems from, like, remember when we were talking with Carlos about, and this is another patron video, uh, patron audio clip, we were talking about Athens 2004 and what right. happened with the venues. And Carlos was talking about how that was still the era of big venue where all the international federations insisted on new venues. And that was one of the things that uh, undid Athens. But he says a lot more in the, the audio, so it's really cool if you can check it out. And I wonder, because Pyeongchang was bidding so many times, if the concept of legacy which was starting to get into people's brains just didn't get there right it got on paper in the sense of oh yes we have a legacy plan but it's it's not architectural plans it's like back of the envelope plans right and yeah i mean for a place like pyeongchang which is a little further out and not as heavily populated you really do need plans to draw people there and to make it something, a tourist attraction or develop programs so that the local residents just are still involved and still have that, that magic. We got to go skate there. We should. Road trip. Okay. I'll figure it out. I'll rent the car. (laughs) I'll go learn Korean. Because we saw how well I did with that during the other day. And hey, I'm going for the goal today, so I'm ready. Good. All right. Well, I think that will wrap it up for this week. If you've read Cold War Games or have thoughts about the Melbourne 1956 Olympics, let us know. Email us at olimfever at gmail.com or call our voicemail hotline at 530-763-3837. That's 5307-O-Fever. You can also hit us up on Twitter and Insta at olimfever. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. People can bribe me with food. <laughs>